All right, again, good morning, everyone. So let's sing number 405, the first and last verse. Oh, thou fount of every blessing. And get in the light so I can see it. All right, let us sing. Oh, thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Touch me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I come straight to thee. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy course above. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today, to study your word, and we ask you to be with us as we dwell on what is said. We pray for those who could not be here because, for those who wanted to be here but couldn't because of their health, and we pray for their healing. We also pray for those who need to be here and made a decision not to be here and help them see that their condition is such that they, they need to be here. Not so much to be in our building, but to join in the, the learning and the edification of each other. Help us to reach out to those who Go with us today, help us to do your will today in all matters. Help us to, when we come in contact with people, to help them know that help, help them to know that we care about them in a, in a, in a deeper, in a deeper feeling than just the weather and the family. You guys would turn to uh, Matthew chapter 22. You're kind of in the middle of this chapter, Matthew chapter 22. Of course, we didn't have class last week because I was at Patty, but the week before last, we began chapter 22. We looked, Jesus told a parable of the wedding feast. And so, we are ready to look at, uh, we're going to begin in verse 15, immediately after this parable. And we see that again, you know, Jesus is in the middle of the Pharisees and all these uh, religious uh, leaders trying to trip him up. And so far they've been unable to do that, but I will uh, give them something for their persistence. They don't, they don't quit, they just keep coming after Jesus. You think they learn after a while, but... So what we want to look at today is they're going to, once again, try to trap him. They're going to ask him a question about paying taxes. Okay, something that we all love to do. We all, I know you're as happy as I am about paying taxes. But uh, first of all, does, do you all know, does God command us to pay taxes? Yes. He does, right? We're, we're commanded to obey the government. That's what we're going to look at here. Uh, under certain conditions and so 
nobody likes to pay taxes, but it is something that we're supposed to do. So they're going to ask Jesus about this because they, like I said, they want to trip him up. So let's read verses uh, 15 through 22 in chapter 22. So right immediately after this parable of the wedding feast. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things of which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So once again, the Jewish leaders think that they can trap Jesus, they can put him in a, in a no-win situation. We've already seen that before uh, when they try to get him where they think they will, whatever he answers, it's going to be bad, and Jesus is always able to turn it around on them. And so we saw that he asked that, or he was asked that before, uh, and he came back with them and said, well, what about the, you know, they said, where do you get the authority to do these things? He said, well, why don't, I'm going to ask you guys a question. You answer, and then I'll answer yours. Where did the authority of John come for his baptism? Did it come from God or come from men? Right? And, of course, they said, well, we can't tell. He said, well, then I'm not going to answer your question either. But they thought they had him because they thought, well, if he tells us his authority comes from God, we can get him for blasphemy. And, then, you know, they thought they had him, but they didn't. So this is a very similar situation. They think... No matter what he answers about taxes, we can put him in a bad spot. So we're, they're basically saying, is it lawful to pay tax to the Roman government, to Caesar? Okay? Uh, so they're asking him really a loaded question. But as always, Jesus is going to answer it the, the best way possible. So they're going to be wrong about thinking they can trap him. Jesus is going to give the perfect answer. So... As we look at verse 16, it says here that they sent their disciples, the Pharisees did, with the Herodians. Okay, now we saw the Herodians back in chapter 12, last time we saw them. And so the Herodians, they were given that name because they were supporters of Herod. And so hence the name Herodians was a descriptive term. And what, what did it mean that they're supporters of Herod? Well, they believed that the Roman government did have authority to rule over the Jews. So they supported the Roman government's claim that they had authority over the Jews. Now they also, so what that also meant was they wanted to subvert the law of Moses. Okay, they wanted to, the Herodians wanted to get rid of the Jewish law, the law of Moses, uh, and they wanted to replace that with Greek and Roman customs. You guys don't need to obey the Old Testament law. You need to obey Greek and Roman customs, traditions, laws. That's what they wanted to replace it with. Now, as we consider the Pharisees, what was it that the Pharisees promoted? I mean, they're against Jesus, but what do they promote? What were they supposed to be keepers of? The old law, right? So they are proponents of the law of Moses, and they're supportive of it, and they believe that's what should govern the Jews. But here we see them working with the Herodians, who are the direct opposites. They don't want the law of Moses. They do believe the Romans have authority over the Jews. The Pharisees believe the Romans should not have authority over the Jews. They believe that God had sole authority over the Jews. 
And yet, they're working together. Even though they're on the opposite end, they, they don't really have anything in common. Oh, except one thing. What do you think the one thing they have in common is? Why would they work together? Yeah, they both hate Jesus. Okay? So, uh, what does the saying go? The, the friend of my enemy is my friend or whatever. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, even though he's my enemy. Right? So, they, they don't like each other, the Pharisees and the Herodians, but they both can't stand Jesus because they both see Jesus as a threat to them. So, they're willing to at least come together temporarily and see what they can do. Now, the Pharisees were willing to conspire with the Herodians because since they were supporters of Herod, they were supporters of the Roman government, the Pharisees thought that the Herodians would have more influence at Herod's court than they, the Pharisees, would have. So they're willing to kind of make this alliance because they think, well, if we get the Herodians to work on this, they've got a better chance of getting Jesus than we do. And we want to get Jesus. So we're, we're just going to hold our nose, so to speak. We'll hold our nose and we'll work with these skunks. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what they're doing. Um, so they thought the Herodians could help make a case against Jesus with the Romans. Now, why do they need to make a case for the Romans? We've talked about that in some sermons. I mean, we hadn't gotten to that in Matthew yet, but why do they need them? Well, they are in power, but ultimately, what do they want to do to Jesus? They want to kill him. Are they allowed to do that? No. Who has to do that? The Romans have to do it, right? So they're already plotting this out, thinking we, we've got to get the Roman government involved here because ultimately... The way we want to get rid of Jesus, only the Romans can do that for us. We're not allowed to do it ourselves. And so they're willing to work with the Herodians, who they also hate and can't stand, but, but they hate Jesus worse. So they're going to try to do this. Okay, so they, the Pharisees send the Herodians in. Well, why don't you guys see if you can trap him uh, in his language, as they said. How can we tangle him in his speech? They're trying to get him. So the Herodians come in. They're the ones that ask the question. So the Pharisees have already been quizzing Jesus, and Jesus has shot them down every time. Well, so let's let the Herodians take a shot and see what they do. So notice there in verse 16 what the Herodians say to him. So first of all, they call him Master. Okay? Master. We know that thou art true. And teach us the way of God and truth. Neither careth thou for carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Okay, so what does it say? What are they doing here? Yeah, do they really believe that? They don't believe. They hate Jesus, right? So they don't really. It must have been really hard on them to call him master, but they're they're trying to set him up again. So they're. You can almost hear the sarcasm coming out, right? But master, we know that you're true. Well, they don't believe that. But yeah, trying to butter him up, trying to flatter him, trying to boost his ego. Now, is that going to work? No. No. Jesus is the Son of God. You're not, he's not, he doesn't have an ego, and you're not going to flatter him. That's what works on people. That's not going to work on God. Okay, but that's what they're trying to do, to try to boost him out. Oh, we know you're so awesome, you're so wonderful. You think Jesus saw through that? Well, you know he did. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus like, yeah, right, yeah, tell me another. He knows, right? So they're, they're trying to butter him up, and oh, we know you teach the, the way of God, and they don't believe any of that, okay? But notice where they kind of set him up here at the end of the verse. Neither carest thou, we know that you don't care for any man, you know, God has no respecter of persons, but in the human world, are most people respecters of persons? Yeah. Yeah. Right? So the President of the United States or the King of England or the Prime Minister of some country would typically, most people would look at them greater than they would look at you or me. We're just peasants, right? So, but somebody up in a high position 
And so they're setting him up because they know they're about to ask him about the emperor. So, well, we know that, you know, you're not a respecter of persons. And, but the idea is, well, you are, you're supposed to be because Caesar is above everybody. So they're, they're kind of, while they're flattering him, they're still setting him up, setting the stage for this. Well, we know you don't think anybody should be better than anybody else. And that, that's true. But they don't believe that. They do believe there's a hierarchy and a rank. Jesus has told us that with God, how does God see us? Everybody, everybody the same, right? He, he doesn't rank the President of the United States higher than you or me. Right? Or the king or whoever. It, nobody that God is not a respecter of persons. And so Jesus has taught that. They know, but they're, well, if he, if he really comes out with that doctrine now or we'll be able to nail him on that because you're saying that Caesar should not be placed above everybody. So they're, they're trying to set him up with that. Okay, but it's not going to work. And so then you get to verse 17. So knowing all those things, well then tell us, what, what do you think? Is, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Should we give tribute to Caesar? Okay, and so that word tribute uh, sometimes we use it in the 21st century in a little bit different sense than they did. But probably our definition of that, it's only been in the last couple of hundred years. Before that, they typically used it in this sense. So it wasn't just in the first century. But so when we think of, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay tribute to this person, what do we think? Praise. Yeah, praise, honor. We don't really think about tax. We just think about, oh, you're, you're honoring somebody. You know, we're going to have a tribute to somebody that maybe just passed away or, or maybe it's somebody that's still alive and they're going to get an award or something. Or we're going to have a tribute ceremony. That's kind of what we call it. But tribute for them, and really all the way through pretty much the 1800s, most everybody understood tribute to mean tax. Okay? you pay tribute, it means you literally you're paying a tax to someone. We don't use it that way anymore, but they did. So they said, is it lawful to give tribute, in other words, to pay taxes unto Caesar? Do you think it's lawful or do you think it's not lawful? So that's the question. Now, what are they talking about exactly, specifically here? Well, they're talking about a poll tax. Okay, and the poll tax, the Roman government had required of every adult Jew. So this was a tax directed specifically at the Jews. This is what the Herodians are talking about. Is it lawful for the emperor to tax the Jews, specify the Jews have to pay a certain tax? So he's, they, they're not asking just about Roman taxes in general, very specific. Okay, do you think the Roman government, the emperor, has the authority to, to single out the Jews for a specific tax just because they're Jews? So that's what they're asking. Now, the Jews themselves, what do you think their opinion was of this poll tax? Do you think they were okay with it or were they opposed to it? I mean, we're all generally kind of opposed to taxes, but... Specifically, a tax directed at the Jews. How do you think the Jews felt about that? Yeah, they were adamantly opposed to it, right? Because they didn't believe the Romans had authority. To Only God had authority over them, they thought, right? So to specifically single us out for a tax, that was extra insulting beyond just the other taxes, right? So they are furious that they have to pay this tax, but they have to pay it. Because if they don't, they know what's going to happen. The army's going to come in and you're going to be imprisoned or killed or your property's going to be confiscated. So they're forced to pay it. But they absolutely hate it. Okay? And of course the Herodians know that. Okay? So they were opposed to paying taxes from what they considered to be a foreign government. Not a Jewish government, but a government of the Gentiles, the heathens. Right? So hold your place here. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And this is where they get this from. They believed the Romans, since they were not Jews, they had no authority over them. And they believed that's what God's law taught. And they get this from Deuteronomy chapter 17. 
Okay, so we're going to read there, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. Notice here what he says. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So this is where they base that on. Well, God has said that if the Jews are going to have the king and have a leader, it's got to be a Jew. It can't be a Roman or anybody else that's not a Jew. So they believe this was violating the law of Moses. Okay? And so they, when they ask Jesus this question, that's kind of the background, right? They know that all the, there's, there's a lot of Jewish people standing around listening to this exchange. And so they think they have him trapped. Because if he says that it is lawful, how are the Jews going to react? That's, that's wrong. That's yeah, you're, you're violating, they've already accused him of, you're, you're violating the law. Jesus said, no, I'm not. I came to fulfill the law, right? So if he says it is lawful, they're thinking the Jews will turn against Jesus. How can you declare that this is lawful? On the other hand, if he says, no, it's not lawful, the Jews should not have to pay this tax to Caesar, then what can they do? How can they get Jesus in trouble for that? If he says, yeah, you don't have to pay taxes to Caesar, what could they do to him then? Yeah, just like if I told you, well, you don't have to pay your taxes. Well, how's the IRS going to handle that? Are they going to go, oh, well, okay, that's fine. <laughs> or are they going to come after you? Yeah. And they're going to come after me too, right? Because I told you, hey, guys, don't pay your taxes, right? right? Yeah, the IRS is going to be breathing down on all of us, okay? So if Jesus publicly said, yeah, you don't have to pay taxes to Caesar, Caesar's not only going to appreciate that, they're going to consider that a rebellion. And they can go to Caesar and say, hey, there's this guy down here, he's encouraging people to rebel against you, not pay their lawful taxes. They don't know somebody if they're in trouble. Yeah, they're in big trouble. Okay, and the main thing, of course, is to get Jesus. Right, so, hey, if he says it's lawful, then the Jews are going to turn against him. If he says it's unlawful, then the Roman government's going to come down on him like a ton of bricks, which is what we want. So they think they've got it. There, there's no good answer here, whichever way he goes. But once again, Jesus is going to thwart their efforts and come up with the perfect answer. Okay? So in verse 19, you know, 18, he says, why tempt me? He tells me, you're a hypocrite. I know you're trying to tempt me. Why, why are you wasting your time doing this? But in verse 19, show me the tribute money, so show me a coin. And they brought unto him a penny. And again, that's translated into English as penny. A penny was a denarius uh, in their language in the first century, and that was basically a, a day's wage. Okay, So you, if you were a typical, just an average worker, uh, a day laborer, you would get a denarius a day. And we would go, well, that's not much money. And it wasn't much money, but you could buy food. I mean, you could buy enough to sustain your existence, but you weren't going to get rich off that. But Jesus said, well, bring me a coin. Okay? And then so he says, they brought in the penny. Whose image is this? Who's, whose image is on here? Whose name is on here? Caesar. Yeah, what? Caesar. Right, his image is on there, and his name's on there. It's inscribed, and so Jesus said, "Well, then that means this is Caesar's property. So render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. If Caesar thinks gold coins are important, then give it to him. 
Does God care for gold coins? What's God going to do with gold? He doesn't care about money. That's a human thing, right? So Jesus gives the perfect answer. Well, this is a big deal to Caesar, so if it's his, give it to him. But render the true worship and the true blessings to God, because that God doesn't care anything about gold coins anyway. So you don't have to do that for God. So it's the perfect answer. It's, it's Caesar's property, so he's saying the Jews do have an obligation to give Caesar's property back to him. Okay? Uh, now, if we were to look at, we're not going to go read it, but if you look at Romans chapter 13, you see that this is where God ordains the existence of human government. Okay, God authorizes for us that, yeah, we're not to live in anarchy. We need some kind of government. We need some kind of organization. And so God authorizes that in, in Romans 13. So if, if government is ordained by God, and it is, then for the Jews... And for us today as Christians, are we obligated to obey a God-ordained government? Yes. 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 But, but we're getting, there's an exception. Get, getting corrupt. Right, right. So we are obligated to obey the laws of government because God ordained the government. And I'm getting to the exception here in a second. Okay, so we're, but this is the point Jesus is making here. So God has ordained governments over men. So Caesar's got these gold coins. It's important to him. So fine, render unto him what is his. So it, Jesus is telling them we have spiritual responsibilities, which is most important. That's why he's saying render unto God what is God's. So we have spiritual responsibility, but at the same time, we also have earthly responsibilities. And Jesus is acknowledging you do have earthly obligations, and you need to fulfill those, okay? So he's telling them, obey the government unless what? That's what Maurice is talking about. Laws contrary to mine. Okay, if our government passes laws that are contrary to the laws of God, then we are not obligated to obey those laws. We got a full time job right now because our government is very corrupt. Most human governments are because they're run by corrupt people. Not that everybody in the government's corrupt, but we all know there are some that are. Uh, and they're not particularly, seems to me, our government right now is not particularly interested in doing God's will. You know, but, well, let's, let's make sure we're doing moral things. That's not really high on their agenda right now. So notice if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 17. Here we see the basic principle that we are to obey the government. Okay, you can't just say, well, I don't like the government, so I'm not going to do anything they say. That would also be sinful against God. So 1 Peter 2 and 15, notice what it says. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and then it says honor the king. That's talking about the government. Okay, so respect the laws of the land. But if you look at Acts 5 and 29, then we get the exception. Okay, in general, you are to obey the laws of the land unless, and Acts 5 29 says, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Okay, and the, again, the principle is, if men are telling you to do something contrary to, to what we know is righteous, what we know is moral, what we know is pleasing to God, then we have to fight against those things. We are not supposed to go along with immoral laws. We have to do everything we can to try to fight against those. Okay? And if that means we have to go to jail, then that's what we do. Right? Did Paul go to prison? Yep. Right? For what? For preaching the gospel. But he's like, well, if you tell me I can't preach the gospel, I'm not going to respect that law. And that's what basically they had done. They had made it illegal. And Paul said, well, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to disobey that law because God told me to preach the gospel. Okay? And so, like we 
talked about this before, um, and I talked about this over at Patty. You know, there's a movement. Some people want to make the Bible hate speech. They want to declare the Bible is illegal. And so people like me would, would no longer be allowed to preach the Bible if they were to pass those laws. And I don't think it's anywhere close to passing right now, but it's scary that some people in government are actually proposing things like this. Um, and so if the U.S. government declared, well, the Bible is hate speech and we can no longer teach the Bible, what would I need to do? Preach the Bible. Keep preaching it. And if they come arrest me, they come arrest me. Okay, some have also argued that uh, they want to uh, impose that we, we've talked recently about homosexuality, right? They want to make it a law where preachers have to marry homosexual couples. Like, I would be required by law, you know, if two men walked in here and said, we want to get married, you have to marry us. They want to make that a law. Well, again, I would have to say, well, put the cuffs on me. I'm not doing it. God has declared marriage is between a man and a woman, and that's it. So I'm not going to marry two men or two women. You're going to have to lock me up. I would have to be willing to go to jail on something like that. I hope it doesn't come to that, but there are some people that are, you know, mentioning that. They'd like to see that happen. Uh, you might say, well, doesn't that violate the First Amendment? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when does that stop some people, right? They violate the Constitution all the time. So uh, the First Amendment is supposed to protect free speech and that we have a free exchange of ideas. And, but there are a lot of people that uh, want to get rid of that. So yes, we, but we are to obey the government. So like, you know, out here on 411 going through Etowah, speed limit's 30 miles an hour. So as a Christian, can I ignore that speed limit? No. No, I have to obey it, right? Because it doesn't violate any command of God. I have to, that's honoring the king, right? I've got to respect the laws of the land as long as they don't violate the laws of God. So if there's a speed limit or something, that, yeah, I, I have to. I can't say, well, I'm a Christian, so I don't have to obey the law. God said, obey the laws unless it conflicts with what I've told you to do. Then we have to follow God. Okay, so Jesus is saying, well, give to Caesar whatever is important to him. God really doesn't care anything about gold coins anyway. So go ahead and obey that, but you still need to render your service to God. So it's really the perfect answer that they really cannot attack him on. And so you notice in verse 22, when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. What do you think it means that they, they marveled? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Frustrated too, probably right there. Like, yeah. I could have sworn we had him on this one, boys. I just knew we had him on this one. Man, this guy weasels out of everything. It's like no matter what you ask him, you think you've got him in a no-win situation, and he still comes out smelling like a rose. You know, so I think they're just kind of, you know, flabbergasted that we just, we can't seem to get him. Every time we think we've got the perfect trap, there's no back door out. He always finds a back door where we didn't think there was a back door, but this guy always finds it. And so he manages to answer the question in a way that didn't anger the Jews, but also they couldn't claim treason against Caesar, right? So he, he really frustrates them in their efforts to do this. All right, so any questions or comments about this? All right, well, we're going to go ahead and stop. I mean, we only got about three minutes left, and I, I kept y'all over some, so I'll probably owe you some time anyway because I don't want to. We just barely get into the next section. Uh, Jesus is going to be asked a very interesting question about the resurrection. So I don't really want to get in the middle of that. So we'll, Lord willing, we'll save that uh, for next week. So we'll begin next week in verse uh, 23. So we'll take a break for a few minutes and have our worship service.